Hello friends, Steve Dangle here, and the following is a video I took on my phone a few years ago while recording the audiobook for my book. This team is ruining my life, but I love them. How I became a professional hockey fan. I uploaded a couple other clips a few years ago, and I never got around to uploading this one. This is of the final two chapters of the book. The first chapter is my first game, about the first hockey game I ever played, and I think it's uh, not exactly your typical first ice hockey game that you ever played, and the final chapter of the book, Intermission. Uh, it's a little, it's a fun little time capsule, because a few things have happened since then. Enjoy! My first game. Ken Reed is one of my favorite guests we've ever had on the podcast. He's an anchor on Sportsnet, and an East Coaster through and through. When he came on the podcast, he spoke about his high school in Pictou, Nova Scotia, and specifically his gym teacher, Mr. Yankov, who would shout, Out of here, boy! whenever he kicked a student out of his class. Ken was promoting his book, One Night Only, about players who managed to play only a single NHL game. Because Ken was such a riot, I think he sold a lot of books that day. In many ways, Ken is responsible for putting me on the radar of ECW Press, the publisher of this book. Ken is also responsible for the first full equipment hockey game I ever played. One day, Ken texted me and asked if I wanted to join his hockey team for the Celebrity Hockey Classic Series, a series of charity hockey tournaments. Different NHL alumni were in charge of different tournaments, and it just so happened that the one Ken wanted me to play in was led by none other than Eric Lindros. There's just one small problem. I can't play hockey. At least, I had never played before. I could barely skate, and I definitely didn't know how to stop. So, Ken replied, he explained that at least one other member of our team was just learning how to skate himself. The point of the tournament wasn't to turn heads in the scouting department. It was to raise money for charity. Not just any charity, either. It was for Easter Seals, a charity for children with physical disabilities. Not only is Easter Seals a great cause, but it's one that helped my family directly. It was difficult for all four of us, both of my parents, my sister and I, to get out of the house together at the same time. Usually just the park and McDonald's. Easter Seals hold summer camps designed to enrich the lives of kids with physical disabilities, like my sister, and their families. They provided a fun experience that we all still remember and look back on fondly. Easter Seals also provided funding for leg braces and a walker for my sister. Not to mention, the tournament was scheduled to be in Whitby, just a 15-minute drive away from me. Steve, what's the issue here? You can't play hockey? Well, Ken said you don't have to know how. Plus, it's down the street and it's for charity. You've always wanted to finally play a game. What are you waiting for? Had it not been for Easter Seals, I might have chickened out. But it was finally time. At 29 years old, after a decade of talking hockey for a living, I was finally going to play in my first full equipment hockey game. In the week before the big day, we got our schedules. Our team was scheduled to play at 8, 11, and 1. Now, I've only played shinny a couple of times, and from those experiences, I know that sometimes ice is only available really late. Wow, we have a 1 a.m. game, I thought. Ah, whatever, it's for charity. The night before the tournament, there was a draft party not far from my home in Oshawa. Every team in the tournament was there, and there were about two dozen NHL alumni in attendance. Ken introduced me to some of our teammates, including Dennis Marouk. If you've never heard of Dennis, that's part of the reason why Ken helped him write the book Dennis Marouk, the unforgettable story of hockey's forgotten 60-goal man. Marouk is one of just 20 players to ever score 60 goals in a season. The only problem is that he accomplished this feat during the 81-82 NHL season, the year Wayne Gretzky scored 92. 
the still-standing record. In fact, Marouk finished third in goal scoring that season because Mike Bossy scored 64. Each team got to pick one NHL alumni to play on their team with them. The draft party was set up so that whichever team raised the most money got the first pick, the second place team got the second pick, and so on. We had already made up our mind that we were picking Dennis no matter what. At one point, Eric Lindros was invited to say a few words to everybody. The more he spoke about Easter Seals, the amount of money we raised, and how much kids are going to benefit as a result, the more you could tell how much the tournament's success meant to him. He was genuine. Anybody can smile and take a few pictures, but a true superstar uses their platform and takes action with pride. I snapped out of my Eric Lindros love fog when I overheard my teammates talking about the next morning. I wanted to hear what their plans were. Maybe there was a team breakfast I hadn't heard about or something. They thought I was kidding at first until one of them asked, wait, do you think all our games are tomorrow night? As it turns out, they don't hold hockey tournaments for children's charities at one in the morning. What was I thinking? That meant our first game was at 8 a.m. in about 10 hours. It was hilarious, but now my whole work schedule was shot. The Leafs were playing in L.A. that night, a 10 p.m. Eastern start. I had an article to write and was supposed to submit a short video to use on TV the next night. I rushed home and told my wife. She just laughed because, believe it or not, this isn't the first time she's had to help me out because I'm an idiot. The plan was to turn on the game, write the article at the same time, and make the LFR video afterward. The TV hit just wasn't going to happen. The Leafs got slaughtered that night. They beat the Ducks 3-1 the night before, but on the second half of a back-to-back, -back, poor Curtis McElhaney was getting shelled in net and the Kings were up 3-0 after one. By the end of the second period, they were up 5-0. You might remember that as the night Austin Matthews was awarded two penalty shots in one game. The Leafs made it interesting at the end, but they still lost. There was one other problem. I took a look at the equipment my friend had loaned me for the game. I realized that since I had never worn equipment before, I wasn't even sure how to put it on properly. Mrs. Dangle came through with the clutch YouTube tutorials. Hey, gotta start somewhere, right? I finished my work around 4 a.m., slept for maybe two hours, then got up for the big day. When I entered our team's locker room, there was a nameplate with Steve Glynn on it. They gave me a green jersey with white and black stripes, and it even had my number 10 on the back. I tried to hide how much I was geeking out, but I failed miserably. I had been waiting for this moment for years. I sat near Brendan Dunlop, a friend and Sportsnet anchor who was basically my hockey dad for the day. I told him about my equipment tutorials from the night before. The tip he gave me? Bottoms first. We suited up and got on the ice for warm-up. As I skated around, I could already tell how much better everyone on the team was but I gave them a heads up of the grocery stick Ken had recruited for their team. No cage? Someone asked. Maybe it was because I didn't want to look like even more of a rookie than I already was, but my helmet didn't have a cage or visor. Dude, the face, they said. You're on television. I thought they were just joking until someone took a high wrist shot that whizzed by my head. As soon as I could, I rushed out and got a cage screwed on. Nick Kiprios can wear a hockey scar with pride because he earned it for being a tough guy, whereas I would have gotten mine because I'm a stooge. It was for the best, too. Our first opponent's alumnus player was Ally Afraidy. In our first game, the other team quickly realized I was a bum and took it easy on me. That didn't stop me from being a minus two on my first shift, falling twice, then tripping over the bench. We got caved in 8-2 in our first game. It was awesome. Stumpy Steve Thomas was our next team's alumnus. Maybe he rubbed off on them because they were a bit rougher. One of the other team's guys was clearly playing for a contract and beaking at our bench. Conveniently, 
one of our guys showed up in a bad mood because he missed the first game. One thing led to another, and there was almost a full-on line brawl. I'm watching from the bench like, please have mercy, I'm just a brittle little boy. To recap, our designated enforcer missed the first game, got kicked out of the second game, and was banned from the third game at a charity hockey tournament. If you wrote that into a script for Goon 3, they'd be like, come on, no one's that crazy. Game 2 was an improvement for me. Not only did I manage not to fall down, but I also completed a pass to Dennis Marouk. Skates. We lost that one too. The third game was a lot more even. On one shift, I had shadowed former Leafs captain Rick Vive, meaning I briefly casted a shadow on him while he blew by me. The guys even insisted I take a few face-offs. I even managed to win a few. Thank goodness, because if I had lost them, it's not like I could get the puck back. After the third game, we all went back to the locker room. Compared to the rest of my teammates, I was fresh as a daisy. You don't sweat that much when you barely know how to move around on skates. We stunk, but we had fun and raised a lot of money, which was the reason we were there in the first place. Someone from Easter Seals walked in the room. Is there a Steve Glynn here? She handed me a big white wooden stick with Eric Lindros' autograph on it. Apparently, I was my team's top fundraiser, which meant I got to play in the All-Star game. Good thing I'm still fresh. Instead of one alumnus per side, the teams were divided evenly between alumni and regular Joes. Now I could humiliate myself in front of even more of the people I grew up watching. As soon as I walked into the locker room, there he was, Eric Lindros, the Big E, the guy from the cover of NHL 99. There were some other guys on our team, Lindros's Legion of Doom linemate from the Flyers, John LeClaire, Wayne Primo, and Rick Natris, just to name a few. Dennis Baruch was even on my team again. He must have been excited to see me too, a walking, talking minus sign. I told everybody who would listen that this was my first day playing hockey. They couldn't have cared less. Their days of playing for a deal are over. They just want to have some fun and help out the kids. When we got on the ice for warm-up, it was obvious that things were different for this game. There were spectators watching in the stands, and there was a red carpet on the ice. All the alumni were wearing the jersey of the NHL team they had played for the most. I looked over at the other team, Leafs jersey, Leafs jersey, there's another Leafs jersey, and another. Oh my god, we're just playing against Leafs alumni. So, on my first day ever playing hockey, I got to play with Eric Lindros against the Leafs. We all lined up on the blue lines for the anthem. Lindros said a few words. Players wheeled kids from Easter Seals onto the ice for the ceremonial puck drop. They weren't messing around. The alumni pretty much let common scum like me do whatever we wanted, but they turned on the Jets when they were one-on-one -on -one with other alumni. I couldn't help but stare in awe at what these guys could do. Months after the tournament, I found a picture on the Easter Seals Ontario website, and if you look closely enough in the background, you can see me picking my nose on the bench. That was the biggest contribution I made to my team. Lindros and LeClaire got a clear two-man breakaway. LeClaire over to Lindros, who buried it. The Legion of Doom hadn't even lost a step. When they got back to the bench, Lindros leaned over and yelled to LeClaire, I missed you! My biggest on-ice contribution was a block to shot. I think it was by Gary Lehman. And I even kind of meant to do it. He even congratulated me. Nick Antropov wasn't trying to make friends, though. He dangled my jock off. At one point, I got the puck in the offensive zone. Everyone backed off and told me to shoot. I looked around and ended up passing it. They were all just being nice, but I had never scored a goal before, and I didn't want my first one to be handed to me. I don't care who I'm playing with or against. I want to get better and actually earn my first goal. Is that dumb? Am I nuts? After the game, we lined up, shook hands, and hit the showers. Like I've said, 
I didn't grow up playing hockey. That means I never really grew up in locker rooms either. To this day, they make me kind of uncomfortable. I don't even like public bathrooms because blech. NHL players are the polar opposite of that. These guys throw off their clothes with a single flick of the wrist. They've been doing this their entire life. Practice, locker room, before and after. Morning skate, locker room, before and after. Game day, locker room, before and after. Not to mention guys like Patrick Marlowe who dive into an ice bath at intermission. Professional hockey players spend half their life just getting changed. I don't know when it happens, but at some point, older dudes just stay naked. I think it starts after your 48th birthday, but that's just a guess. Who's got time for a towel? Not me. I'm old. Get out of the way. So now I'm in a room with my idols who are naked, and I'm trying my best to cope. There's just a lot going on. Eyes to the floor, eyes to the ceiling. Please, Lord, I need to see 0% of this. At the same time, these guys I grew up watching are trying to make friendly banter, and I'm trying to listen. I just played hockey with them for like 45 minutes. The locker room started to clear out. It took me longer than everyone else to get my equipment off and shove it into the bag because I had no idea what I was doing. Plus, screw showering here, dude. I live 15 minutes away. I'll shower at home. I know a lot of you are judging me right now, and I don't care because shut up, my bathroom has a lock on it. I realize that one of the half dozen or so people left in the room is Lindros. Throughout the festivities of the tournament, I still hadn't introduced myself or anything. I didn't want to bother him or ask for something like an interview or podcast appearance. I just wanted to let him know I thought what he did with this tournament was awesome. I could tell it meant a lot to him and thank him for helping to organize such a great event. The only problem is, for some reason, this guy's still stark naked. No towel, nothing. But it's okay, that's fine, he's going to get dressed eventually, right? I just made small talk with a few of the other guys on the team. Dennis Marouk was still there, and I spoke with Rick Natras, too. After, like, five minutes, this guy was still naked. All right, I don't want to just stand here like a creep. I gotta leave. But I also want my little moment with Lindros. The scenario I came up with in my head is that I would walk over to him to introduce myself, he would realize he had no clothes on, quickly grab a towel, and we'd shake hands. I walk over to him. There he is. We make eye contact. I extend my hand for a handshake. He grabbed my hand back and just stood up. Now I'm shaking hands with a butt-naked Eric Lindros. This uh, was not a moment that I saw coming in my life. I told him how much I appreciated the tournament and how much he helped with the charity. He thanked me for coming out. I'm just staring him dead in the face because there's no way I'm looking anywhere else right now. We said our polite goodbyes, and I left. I'm walking out of the arena like, did that seriously just happen? Then I drove home and had a shower. I know, shut up. I stunk on ice that day, literally, but it was for a good cause. Between all the teams at the tournament, we helped raise over $325,000 for Easter Seals. That was the whole point of it all. It felt amazing to help pay back a charity that did right by my family all those years ago. And that's the story of my first hockey game. I should mention that the next fall, in 2018, I played in the tournament again. This time, Ken made me captain because I was the top fundraiser my first time around. I wrangled a bunch of the players we had previously, and I also recruited over a dozen of my friends and family. We ended up signing up 30 players, enough for two full teams. We called ourselves Rachel's Raiders, in honor of my sister. Our alumni were Steve Thomas, the player I saw fight Darcy Tucker at my last ever game at Maple Leaf Gardens, and cantankerous Hockey Hall of Fame goalie Billy Smith. I still stunk on ice, but I had learned how to stop on both my left and right, and I could pull off something that resembled a crossover. I'm not quite Mitch Marner level, but I'm working on it. Between our two teams, we raised over $55,000 for Easter Seals, while every team in the tournament combined to raise nearly half a million. 
We did a tremendous amount of good for people who need it. And to me, that feels so much better than scoring a goal. At least, I assume so. I still haven't scored. Oh, and the next time I met Lindros, he had his clothes on. Intermission. When I got back from summer break in 2015, I found out they were going to discontinue the sheet. I thought I might get laid off again, but thankfully, things were different this time. Dan kept me under the digital budget instead of the radio side. The plan was for me to keep making videos and doing my podcast, which remained independently owned. Added to that, however, I wrote articles for Sportsnet.ca, made videos for the Sportsnet YouTube channel, and there were TV hits once or twice per week. At long last, my sole job was to be a hockey blogger. Full time. This is what I had dreamed about when I decided to make a video after every Leafs game. I'm literally living the dream. As Sportsnet's own Chris Johnston puts it, we work at the toy store. It's difficult to write about Sportsnet because I still work there and don't really have much hindsight. I do have some favorite memories already, though. Someone who has had a strong influence on me is Mike Cormack, the managing editor of All Things Digital on Sportsnet. He's one of the smartest, most creative people I've ever worked with. He has the unique ability to mask criticism as ideas to get better. With Mike, it's never about how it's bad. It's about how it could be better. If you create content of any kind, whether it's for a living or a hobby, it's easy to become protective of it. I'm always excited to tell Mike about an idea I have because if he likes it, then it's good. And if he doesn't like it, he knows how to make it better. Mike has helped me develop several written series that have done extremely well, including my Trade Tree articles. It began with an article where I traced back the ripple effect of the trade where the Leafs sent defender Anton Strahlman to the Calgary Flames. The article did so well, we made Trade Trees a regular feature. Rather than just take clips from videos I had already made, the powers that be at Sportsnet gave me the opportunity to make 90 second videos for TV specifically Hockey Central, and sometimes Leafs pregame shows. My favorite one to date was after the Leafs traded Peter Holland to Arizona about a week before he came to town with the Coyotes. My video was about my Leafs paranoia, wondering how Holland was going to find a way to beat the Leafs in his return. Sure enough, Holland scored the shootout winner. They talked about the video again after the game. Like, come on. What are the odds? Well, any Leafs fan will tell you, voodoo, wizardry, and bullshit are always possibilities when it comes to the blue and white. The Leafs trading Phil Kessel to Pittsburgh was another big day. I made a nine-minute rant about how the Leafs completely pissed away Kessel, who, in his prime, was one of the best goal scorers they've ever had. On top of losing my mind, I also spoke about how the Penguins' window to win was now, and that they're on the frickin' clock. They followed that up with back-to-back -back cups, and now Phil Kessel is a two-time Stanley Cup champion. Speaking of which, I met Sidney Crosby and got him to say that on camera. Also, I've met Sidney freaking Crosby. I was at G-Camp, a camp put on by Gatorade for young hockey players who have been through a lot and have amazing stories. Max Pacioretty was there, Johnny Gaudreau, noted Toronto Maple Leaf John Tavares, Marie-Philippe Poulain, Haley Wickenheiser, P.K. Subban, Dominic Moore, Brent Burns, everybody. But Sid is Sid. When the day began, I asked for time with Crosby and was given no promises. Around midday, I was told I could have three minutes. I told them I needed 30 seconds. I went up to Sid and asked him to say, Phil Kessel is a Stanley Cup champion. That was it. They didn't believe me when I told them 30 seconds. It was actually less. As a result, my Sportsnet co-worker, reporter Luke Fox, who was taking the video on my phone, got a one-on-one -on -one sit down with Sid for the remaining two and a half minutes. One of the first videos I ever made with Sportsnet was with Luke. We went to the ACC, now Scotiabank Arena, 
to try all their fancy new concession food. Luke came up with the brilliant grading system of Shanahan's. Speaking of Brendan Shanahan, I got to go to Leafs Media Day for a feature in 2016. While I was getting my close-up with all the fancy cameras they had, I heard someone yell, Dangle! It was Brendan Shanahan. You want to get in on this? I yelled back. Yeah, uh, no, I'm busy, he said sarcastically, without even looking or breaking stride. Someone who knew me all the way back from when I worked at Leafs TV must have been keeping me in mind, because when the Leafs unexpectedly made the 2017 playoffs, they asked me to co-host the tailgate parties in Maple Leaf Square for the home games. It was awesome getting on stage in front of all those screaming fans. I remembered when I wanted to cry in Maple Leaf Square after getting let go by Leafs TV, and now there I was, a lot closer to fainting than crying. And the DJ on stage? None other than DJ Docta, the DJ I had spent many nights with in the Real Sports DJ booth while hosting the MapleLeafs.com chats. Have I mentioned the world is small? Speaking of Leafs unexpectedly making the playoffs, I was in the CBC building when the Leafs won the 2016 NHL Draft Lottery. And, therefore, Austin Matthews. The Leafs won a thing! I even got to pose with the number one card that Shanahan held. Brendan Shanahan played at the alumni game at the Centennial Classic in 2017. While he was unfortunately on the Detroit Red Wings alumni team, somebody else was not. Felix Potvin. After the alumni game, I got to go into the locker room to interview him. It was a very surreal moment. The interview wasn't long or in-depth. I wasn't going to be winning an Edward R. Murrow Award, that's for sure. But there he was, Felix Potvin. He was one of the reasons I fell in love with hockey in the first place, and here I was covering hockey for a living and talking to him. Speaking of goalies I adore, I got to speak with James Reimer over the phone after his rookie season and after his first AHL game. But, finally, during the 2016-17 season, I got to formally meet him. He was fully aware of my unhealthy obsession with him, but for some reason, he didn't run. Unfortunately, he was now on the Florida Panthers. Still, we had a great talk, and he was a good sport. He even wore the little plastic Optimus Prime mask I brought in for him as a prop. As for the podcast, it is everything I could ever hope for and more. Every time we do the show, I step in there with two of my brothers. Shut up, I know it's corny. Just let me be emotional, all right? Adam and Jesse have the ability to make me gut laugh until my invisible abs hurt. They're witty, they're insightful, they're original, and they're creative. People always tell us that the show just sounds like three friends talking. That's because it is. Some of my favorite podcast guests include former Leafs goalie Ben Scrivens, who talked about his wacky 2015-16 season with the Oilers and Canadians, Ken Reed, who is one of the best storytellers in the country, but then again, so are the likes of Elliot Friedman and Jeff Merrick. Everyone we've had from Sportsnet has been great. Saskia Stewart, the first lady of Australian ice hockey, who can spin a good yarn. Steve Simmons, who was one of our first guests, and while we often disagree, I'll always respect him for even coming on. In Adam's mom's basement, no less. Honestly, I could list every guest we've ever had. But how do you top Ron McLean? I mean, come on. He held court for one hour and 41 minutes. The conversation went from hockey to obscure professional wrestling to music, politics, shirtless air guitar, and opening packs of hockey cards. And lastly, we have had the true privilege and good fortune of meeting so many of our listeners, whether they were locals, had driven in from Ottawa or Pennsylvania, or flown in from Florida or Texas. We had a simple idea. Get together, eat pizza, watch hockey. A lot of Canadians just call that Saturday, but we christened it Hockey Night in Cinema. Our podcast listeners would pack into a theater, free of charge, Panago would provide the free deliciousness, and we would watch Hockey Night in Canada up on the big screen. Listeners of the podcast packed the house four times, twice in Toronto, once in Ottawa, 
and once in London, Ontario. We got to witness Mitch Marner score his first career NHL goal, saw Frederick Anderson pick up his first ever Leafs win, and watch the legend of Curtis McElhaney come to life. One day on the podcast, Adam and Jesse were talking about what fans of certain celebrities call themselves. For example, fans of Beyonce are called the Beehive. Jesse discovered that fans of Rihanna called themselves the Rihanna Navy because she was in the movie Battleship. I said that was the dumbest thing ever, so naturally, Adam and Jesse loved it and suggested listeners of the podcast be called the Dangle Navy. For whatever reason, listeners loved it and immediately started using it and hashtagging it. Once at a Marley's game, we dedicated a section of the stands for our listeners. Several people showed up with Dangle Navy signs and one person even came in a full sailor's outfit. I'm sure my grandpa is proud. My life has been a whirlwind and I'm more than grateful for it. Hell, I was at a Leafs playoff game in 2018 and Austin Matthews' parents came up to me and asked for a picture. These two were acting like they weren't the two blessed godsends who gave birth to the savior of a franchise. How does one even process that? A few months into the 2018-19 NHL season, my role at Sportsnet has evolved. I'm making videos and working the social media desk for Sportsnet's ice surfing broadcasts. The broadcasts are live streamed on Twitter once a week from a studio in the CBC building. We flip from game to game around the NHL talking about all the action. Who's we? Stan Narodka is our stats man. Jason York, who played in 757 NHL games, is our analyst. And our host? None other than Jeff Merrick. Doesn't get much more full circle than that. I even run a knockoff version of the iDesk. All this thanks to a girl who got me a $77 webcam for 23 bucks. As I write this chapter, I'm 30 years old. I don't know what will happen next. I also know that I'm not done yet. Just don't ask me where I see myself in five years. Hopefully, my story can convince you to try something you've been afraid to try for too long. Maybe learn a new skill, change career paths, or win a Stanley Cup ring. Listen, I've believed in the Toronto Maple Leafs for my entire life. The least you could do is believe in yourself. Okay. Yeah, bud.